Hello, everyone, and welcome to the panel role of AI in health tech. We have with us Lina Emanuel, who's CEO of BrainSight AI, Ravi Chiukula, who is co founder and CEO of Heart Health Technologies, and Niranjan Subara, who's co founder of Cyclops MedTech. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the panel. Niranjan, let's begin with you. And I want to understand, uh, throw some light on how AI is evolving to be a part of processes like developing a drug or a treatment to diagnosis. Yeah, uh, so what I'll do is I'll, uh, probably I can uh, talk about this uh, from a context of what we are doing here at uh, Cyclops and it will be relatively easier for me to relate, relate how uh, AI is playing a role here, right? So to give a quick background about what we are doing, uh, we are actually using uh, frontier technologies like uh, eye tracking, computer vision, and uh, AIML to build uh, diagnostic and therapeutic products in the area of neurotology as well as uh, ENT and audiology. So the core product that we have built, uh, Balenza Video Oculography, analyzes, uh, captures and analyzes eye movements and uh, helps neurologists, ENT specialists find out the underlying root cause behind dizziness. So when we talk of dizziness, it's just a symptom, right? There are multiple underlying root causes which can throw up symptoms as dizziness. For example, if there's a stroke or a tumor in the brain, that can also throw up symptoms as a dizziness. And if there is a, a more uh, simpler problem like a vertigo, that can also throw up symptoms as dizziness. So it is very important that uh, clinicians do a thorough differential diagnosis and put the root cause into two different buckets. Okay? So this is where our product helps in. Now, in a clinical kind of a setting, right, when we deploy our product, we extensively use computer vision and image processing to analyze the pupil images. Okay, But then we also have a, a consumer version of the product, which uses the front camera of the mobile phone to capture and analyze eye movements. Okay? So this is purely from a screening standpoint. Now here, it will be very, very difficult to use the CV and image processing considering the resource constraints on the edge. So this is where we are using deep learning to kind of mimic the model, okay, uh, which would otherwise have, uh, would have been done on a uh, CV image processing kind of a model. So we use deep learning to uh, do and map uh, predictive pathways of eye movements and thereby arrive at diagnostic conclusions. So this is, this is how we are using, uh, and, and the other use case is uh, when it comes to the actual interpretation of the eye movement data, right? So that's another place where we are uh, building ML models to help clinicians uh, connect the dots, okay? Connect the eye movement data along with the history and arrive at diagnostic conclusions. So this is precisely how we are uh, using uh, AML in our uh, day-to-day work. Thank you, Niranjan. Uh, Ravi, do you want to add to this and how AI is coming into play in every uh, part of the life cycle of health tech? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the use of AI, uh, given that you need repeatability and consistency in the diagnosis and accuracy, uh, we at Heart Health are primarily using it in the imaging analysis to improve accuracy and the variability that comes, we all know of the second opinion, right? Why do you go for a second opinion? Primarily because you want to be sure that the diagnosis taken by one doctor is the same and there's some correlation between them. That diagnostic variability is quite uh, an issue. So that's the second area, the, the two areas. But the third area that is important today in the context of the healthcare systems is, and especially in the context of COVID is, overloaded health systems. Where are the diagnosis doctors? How many doctors are there? Uh, and in India with a GDP spend of under 2%, we have a huge shortage. So what AI can do is to also provide assistance uh, in being able to support in remote locations, in telehealth uh, environments, teleradiology environments. So these three seem to be the broad use cases that are relevant to us uh, right now at Heart Health itself. But uh, like Niranjan mentioned, uh, going into the drug discovery phase, 
what happens when you take a drug and it modifies the uh, metabolism how do you see the impact of a drug today we work on imaging studies that a drug is taken over multiple uh, uh, intervals the impact of the drug on the organ in discussion is taken and and that's another way great way to overall see the progression or regression of the disease apart from what again narendran actually mentioned is correlating it with the population health data with the mm -hmm. health record those are some of the typical use cases that uh, are relevant mm -hmm. apart from just hospital operations triaging so we are speaking of the clinical side but there's also the operational side of healthcare that needs a lot of that uh, support and the applications are really really vast uh, it could go on and on <laughs> yes uh, thank you ravi uh, please, uh... Uh, ravi you mentioned right uh, i'm sorry yeah just to quickly add right if you're looking at the overall application of ai scenario in the health tech scenario right or in the healthcare scenario it's important to analyze the patient's journey right so if you look at a patient okay there are four critical phases right prevention detection intervention and management okay pdim is what uh, we call and across all these four areas there is a definitive requirement for ai based applications now if you were to actually plot how ai is being used across this life cycle right what we get end of the day is a reverse bell curve okay now ai usage is relatively higher when it comes to prevention and management but as you go in towards detection and uh, Uh, intervention it starts reducing and intervention is the least area where ai application is for the right reasons probably not in here and thank you uh, ravi and niranjan for, for that insight uh, into how ai plays a role into every cycle and not just clinical side but also operations as ravi mentioned now uh, let's address this burning topic that's that pandemic has actually accelerated and brought a lot of awareness into and that is mental health uh lina you are ceo of brainside ai and i know you do a lot of work uh with uh, issues related to mental and mental health and bringing awareness i also want to understand how data and predicting the patterns go a long way into early detection and uh, how it can actually save lives sure absolutely okay so i think a quick introduction to what we do would uh, help in setting context what we are uh, we work on the brain what we are essentially looking at uh the way i explain to lay people is we creating a google map of the brain so usually you have the structural road map of the brain to understand things but what we do is overlay the traffic map which is through a very special kind of fmri called a resting state fmri which essentially allows you to build this uh, model of the brain now um in men in a lot of mental health issues um across different uh, there is a uh, potential of using this traffic map of the brain to understand what are some of the patterns that you see let us say in schizophrenia or let's say early signs of psychosis are there neuroimaging indicators you can use to help typify patient and to predict which pathway will they take in the future let's say if it's uh, i think a lot of these disorders are extremely debilitating both for the patient and the caregiver so really planning for it helps one is that so you really at the very early stages second is there is now a lot of work being done on the rehabilitation of patients using techniques like deep brain stimulation and non invasive stimulation i think there were some really interesting studies on using it for major depression for schizophrenia for facial paralysis a bunch of studies now what we also do is when we create these traffic patterns we are also able to say that these are the areas of the brain that you need to stimulate and so being able to actually guide rehabilitation and therapy that also requires a lot of like pattern matching and pattern mining and then saying that okay this is what you need to do and the last piece that we do is essentially mapping this with mental health is really both environmental and neurobiological you need to kind of put the two together and that's also a lot of data a lot of symptomatic trigger data and a lot of brain data neurotransmitter data putting together and then finding even better nuanced patterns uh, for us to build drugs for us to uh, to make therapy more uh, personalized 
that's what we kind of move for. So you have all of these different levels at which we do data mining and data pattern matching to, uh, to help the patient. That's interesting, Lina, and thank you so much for elaborating on that. Uh, stay with me here, Lina, and I want to understand. Now, of course, these emerging technologies pour into uh, healthcare, and we are moving into some unconventional territories. Now, do you need, do you think infrastructure support and the changes that come with it will undergo a huge haul overhaul about after this? Absolutely, I think uh, I'll just take our example itself. So, um, I think. The brain is a very underexplored organ per se. And the reason why it's so unexplored is because the amount of work it takes to be able to even like extract the signal from a brain signal is a very difficult task. Now, what we want to do is to democratize it. And we, like any doctor, can upload a, a, an arresting state fMRI and we are able to do all of this processing, which means that you need infrastructure which can uh, which can allow for that. And uh, to give you an uh, analogy, our brain is like 86 billion neurons getting activated at different intervals, right? That is almost like a city level data. It's almost like the entire Mumbai's traffic patterns just for you, uh, entire Delhi's pattern just for you. So that you can imagine the amount of infrastructure you need and the kind of infrastructure optimization that you need. Um, and so that I, I do believe that there's a lot of space in the next coming years, at least in the neurotech space, where infrastructure will play a very key role on how things can be democratized. Thank you, Lina. That's an interesting point, democratization. Um, now I'll ask uh, Ravi, what is your take, Ravi, on the infrastructure support and changes that will come in and all that need to come in? Primarily, like uh, Naina mentioned, so with so much of data flowing across, uh, one, deep learning is computer intensive. And uh, when you speak of federated learning, you have uh, learning at the edge as well as at the core. And both need to be connected with the uh, data pipes. So the digitalization, the digital infrastructure has to be upped significantly to be able to handle both the compute and the network. And the latencies need to be really, really small uh, to be able to be effective. Uh, today, uh, if you speak of teleradiology or we speak of remote patient monitoring, there are two different dimensions. Till the ideology, you got a day's time to report or hours time to two hours time to report, three hours time to report. So there's enough time for the data to flow across. But what about remote patient monitoring? In the COVID time, we have seen that bringing everybody to a central location risks the spread of the infection. So now, how do you now get the patient at the location and then continuously monitoring it? That kind of infrastructure has to evolve to be able to handle that. And given India's scale, you can pretty much imagine how that will change. Given that we are already a data hungry nation, we are the largest consumer of data. Now we are speaking of health data, video data, uh, radiological information going across network. So both compute infrastructure and network infrastructure have to be significantly scaled up along the way as the pickup of AI happens to have a real impact on health outcomes. Thank you, Ravi. Niranjan, um, we heard insights on innovation. We heard insights on uh, the infrastructure support that, need, that needs to come in or um, how the changes will happen. Now, where does security factor in? And given the patient data is so sensitive and there are certain policies around it, how do you factor in security and what are the techniques or the technologies that you bring in to uh, to prevent such crisis? Uh, before we actually talk in, uh, talk about uh, patient privacy and security, right? So we all we, we need to probably address one of the core underlying elements when we talk about application of AI in healthcare, right? So typically, when we talk about AI, it's all black box architecture, right? Now. Uh, nobody knows what happens under the hood as long as the results are accurate, as long as the sensitivity specificity is taken care of, uh, uh, nobody uh, probably would want to know what's under the hood, right? Now, this is fine in other areas, but when it comes to healthcare, that basic problem needs to be uh, 
kind of uh, tackle, right? We need to move away from black box to what is called as a glass box or a white box or explainable AI, where clinicians clearly need to know, okay? And they need to be comfortable that the result that is derived from this is not only accurate, but then it will continue to remain accurate throughout, right? Even if there is one error, that can be catastrophic, right? So that fundamental problem needs to be addressed that will take care of a lot of security elements as well. Now, secondly, of course, obviously when we integrate AI with blockchain, then to a large extent, a lot of security and uh, privacy issues would be uh, catered to. And thirdly, uh, this is typically from an India context, right? We have the Ayushman Bharat uh, digital mission, uh, sandbox architecture, and you have the APIs, right? And now this is this is built in a very, very secured uh, manner. I'm sure the same thing can be extended towards AI-based applications as well. So today, uh, all digital health applications in India uh, have some kind of a regulatory framework and guidelines coming up, right? And uh, I'm, I'm sure if, if uh, ABDM continues in the same model, then uh, uh, the same thing can uh, be applied for uh, AI-based uh, protocols as well. Okay. Actually, yes, I would okay. like to add to, I, I really like what you talked about explainable AI in engine there. And I think um, when you talked about the glass box analogy, I think um, that's where um, I've been thinking that, you know, essentially having a 3D twin of any organ, right, which is like a glass box where you're actually doing all of these simulations and actually figuring out that, you know, if you're doing this on the heart, if you're doing this on the brain, this is what it really means. And being able to show that to the doctor, that would probably be a much better way to get uh, get people to understand why is the AI making the decisions that it's making. So I'm totally with you there. Yeah. Thank you, Laina. Thank you, Niranjan. Uh, yeah. Ravi, please go ahead. Uh, I want so, to hear your take on it. Given that this transition between uh, human diagnosis interpretation and having that machine being able to intervene at a rapid pace, otherwise there's, that, there's no gap. The gap is because there's a need and the volumes are high. And that's where AI steps in. So one of the transitions that's being spoken of is going through what is called as a decision support, where the AI does not take the decision, but only serves as a recommendation system. And like any other tool that has come, whether it is CT, MR, or any of those imaging techniques or any other tool, uh, go through a transition phase where you move from uh, decision support to decision making. Uh, and it will be a different basis for different use cases. That's one of the stuff, the thought process that's going around, and it will naturally impact the regulatory aspect, which of course uh, is a very critical aspect of putting AI into uh, general use. So that's one uh, aspect uh, from the explainability perspective that I want to. From the privacy preserving nature requirement of healthcare, federated learning uh, is coming out uh, with adequate models that from an infrastructure perspective, only the relevant parameters are transferred from within the hospital or within the healthcare network to a uh, compute public cloud or whatever. Right? That kind of infrastructure technology play is happening where the security of the patient data is preserved or the privacy of the patient data is preserved within the sandbox that uh, Niranjan mentioned. And then the uh, AI part of it is done elsewhere in a public infrastructure because it's too huge for any institution to host that kind of uh, infrastructure. It will default to being a public infrastructure of some sorts. So these two aspects I just wanted to touch upon. Thank you, Ravi. Um, Laina, Ravi, and Niranjan, all of you are um, innovators and represent that area of stakeholders of deep tech ecosystem. Now, what are the challenges in terms of skill set, capital, and policies? And uh, what are the actionable points that can bridge the gap? Ravi, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think uh, from the uh, skill set perspective, uh, AI in healthcare. 
AI per se requires a lot of interdisciplinary skills. It's not just that you know the math and you can apply it in any field. It requires a deep insight into the field to which it is being applied. So one of the first requirements is to have a strong connect between the healthcare system and technology system. It is emerging. Uh, we know of IIT Kanpur setting up a hospital inside its campus for specifically health tech. We know of IIC Bangalore uh, is doing it and there are many other institutions that are doing. So that's the first skill part that needs to be developed where we develop a lot of interdisciplinary uh, capability uh, that is relevant to uh, building that uh, out. The other part, which I touched upon briefly in my previous uh, uh, comment, is uh, on how do you bring it in in a safe manner so that the patient is protected and what Niranjan mentioned and what Lana mentioned that misdiagnosis, which can be disastrous, does not happen because if it happens, then there'll be a consumer pullback and that should not be allowed to happen. So one of the most important part is how do you get to that transition and define policies that will take that graded approach to bringing it in. The need is there, but bringing it in a graded fashion uh, will shape the policy. Thank you, Ravi. Laina, your take on it. You're on mute, you're on mute. I'll add to what Ravi said, and I loved what he said, because uh, interdis our work is very interdisciplinary. So actually really having uh, having a policy which promotes more interdisciplinary work between clinicians and engineers and uh, and in our case, the brain researchers and the scientific community, I think that's one policy uh, thing that I would really kind of love to see going forward. And the other, I think, uh, which you had touched upon, which is really about cybersecurity, HIPAA compliance, all of those, right? So I think I think there are so many different regulations and so many different uh, things that an entrepreneur needs to take care of when they're thinking about this. So are there ways to kind of make that easier? Um, that would probably be another set of uh, recommendations that I would have. So, Thank you, Laina. Niranjan, your take on this? Uh, so I, see, I think uh, basically for any AI initiative to be successful, right, uh, I think data is at the heart and core of it, right? Now, today, if you look at uh, uh, an India context, right, we probably have the largest data sets available anywhere in the world, okay? but then we have numbers, how good is the data, right? So I think we need to have a more disciplined and a more structured approach towards ensuring that the data that we have is, uh, the, the data integrity is good, and then the quality of data is extremely high because see, mm. end of the day, uh, garbage in is garbage out, right? An AI model can produce results as good as the data that we are uh, feeding it. And then it's not just sufficient if we have good the high volumes of data, we need to also ensure that there is an underlying discipline at the grassroots level where the data is gathered. Like say today, if you go to a PHC, uh, right, there is, I mean, every day there is humongous amount of data that we get in multi, uh, pertaining to multiple parameters, right? But then none of those are actually in the shape that is fit to be fed into an AI model to produce results, okay? So I think if we, just concentrate on that one aspect and build some kind of uh, uh, guidelines towards how the data needs to be uh, captured and dealt with. That will ensure that we remain or we move uh, towards the forefront of uh, building AI applications as a country. Sure. Thank you, Niranjan. Well, Niranjan, what do you think is the future of AI in health tech in the coming decade or so? Yeah, so I think... Uh, so I, I mean, uh, uh, I would say uh, as we move forward, AI is going to become more and more relevant in the uh, disease detection and intervention space. Okay, because that is where the real difference uh, will be uh, made. But then we just need to be cautious enough to ensure that doctors are part of the equation because AI can be only as successful as the. Uh, a doctor would allow it to be right now. Uh, we need to be cautious, like Ravi mentioned. We need to be cautious 
to ensure that AI always remains as a aid to diagnosis and not diagnosis in itself. So as long as we stick to that, I think AI is going to make deep inroads into disease detection and intervention. That's going to be the uh, future. Thanks, Nirajan. Wow. That was an interesting point. Huh? How AI should have some of its limitations and we cannot let it get out of hand. Ravi, what's your take on the future of AI in healthcare? Probably AI will come to the support of improving healthcare in India significantly. Just as uh, uh, Lina and uh, Niranjan mentioned, once we figure out the early stages, because the volume is so high mm. that it is uh, impossible to get that much training going in a short span of time. Uh, we have a big task to improve healthcare in India. And I think AI will play a significant role. Uh, not necessarily, I don't know how many of us remember the world of fuzzy logic and uh, washing machines, right? AI does not need to be all pervasive. It is small interventions at the right point in time that can give that added uh, improvement in outcome that will become seamless in the way it is adopted. I think that's where uh, uh, across the board, whether on the clinical side or on the operational side, uh, we'll see it progressively uh, take on more and more uh, to assist the both from a, a clinical perspective, the doctors, the radiologists and the clinicians and the administrators in bringing the whole thing up to uh, global levels. Thank you, Lina. Um, I think in terms of AI, I think there's a lot of uh, now conversation, growing conversation across the world around ethical AI and uh, more explainable AI. And so what I do believe is that um, there will be more focus on uh, including patients in the decisions that affect them. Um, and so how do you kind of include patient voices in thinking about what the AI is saying? I think there'll be more focus on building explainable AI rather than black box algorithms. Um, and I think, uh, and I, as, as the speakers, both of them, Niranjan and Ravi said, right, being able to we'll be able to find more targeted uses of AI, which do not, which don't, as of now, the, the debate is always, oh my God, AI is going to be ubiquitous. It's going to be ubiquitous, but in like small ways. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I believe will uh, will be the future. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lionel. So it was an interesting insight into how um, AI is progressing, but we need to also keep it in check. And then there are certain challenges in terms of skill set and policies, but with the right action points, as all the three panelists mentioned, we can bridge them as well. And we can look forward to more interesting use cases um, where we also have the patient's consent. And it is more of collaboration with the patient and also the caregiver. Uh, and we can come up with interesting results in terms of healthcare. Thank you so much, Ravi. Thank you, Laina and Niranjan for taking time out of the schedule and participating with us on this panel and giving us insights into the role of AI in health tech. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashwini. Thank you. You're right, Ashwini. Thanks to Data Quest and Cyber Media for providing us this opportunity. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.